Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with NEA saxophone jazz master Dave Liebman. Born in Brooklyn, New York, he began classical piano lessons at the age of nine and clarinet and saxophone by 12. His love of jazz was ignited by seeing John Coltrane perform live in New York City clubs when he was younger. And he would use that inspiration to fuel a legendary career that saw him collaborate with the likes of Miles Davis and Elvin Jones and so many others. He spent some time with Neon Jazz picking through a grand jazz ride that he's been on full of stories and wisdom. So please get to know Dave and dig this interview, my friends. Dave, thank you for taking some time out for Neon Jazz. It's a pleasure to speak to you. It's an honor. My pleasure, Joe. Thank you. You bet. So let's dive right in here. I want to start off with the project with Keith Oxman with Glimpses. Talk to me about this project. How did you feel about it? Uh, very nice guys, good musicians, very good situation with teaching. I don't usually do high schools, but I did a bunch of them, which is a challenge, you know, to talk to 16, 15, 16 year olds about jazz, you know, in, in the hip hop age. Um, but, uh, Keith is great and the guys are really good and we made a nice record, uh, I guess last year and that last couple two weeks ago was the opening or the, uh, release of the record. So he said that when you're in the studio, you're like a scientist. You, you are totally into the process. Talk to me about how that happened over time. Have you always loved being in the studio? Uh, I was completely intimidated and scared shit of the studio for, Maybe 50 records of the 500 plus I've done. I mean, I was just so nervous that this is going to be forever, and there's going to be a microscope about what I played, and it's going to be heard in, you know, Cash Kent, and somebody's going to get a bad opinion of my playing. And uh, that was very scary. And, of course, there is that aspect of it that can't be denied, which is taking something that is supposed to be spontaneous on a one-time event when you're improvising and, you know, making it into a... Or to a regulation, to a law, by having it on tape. Oh, this is what I play, and that's it. In fact, I've always heard that Sonny Rollins has always been not comfortable in the studio for something like the reason I'm talking about. It's you know, it's kind of counter to the whole idea of jazz. But in any case, it's it, you reach a lot of people and all that. And what really taught me about the studio was uh, my time with Miles, um, because of course I knew his history and knew everything about his recordings. But to watch him in the studio, how he was very uh, improvisatory. I mean, he the, the green light, you know, in the studio you have a green light, obviously, and a red light. And most people go, okay, take one, and the green light goes on, and at the end the red light goes on. Miles, as soon as you walked into the studio, the, red, the green light was on the whole time. And uh, he would come up with, you know, he was just very, it was like his living room. That's I, I, He felt, he, he appeared to be so comfortable in it. And, and in an improvisatory as mood, I mean, he, you know, it's a little Chinese, China, whatever, you know, and moving very quickly. I mean, he had something on his mind, but he would adjust immediately. And that, that's where I found the, the, what, what the studio can do for you is any musical ideas you may have pertinent to that particular session, you can, for the most part, try it, hear it, accept it, discard it, change it, etc. And that made me realize that the studio was really a lot of fun because you can really be yourself and hear the results right away. So that's, of course, taken more than 500 records to get to that point. But uh, <laughs> but I, I, I did did really enjoy it. Now, with Elvin, who precedes Miles in my dossier, uh, Elvin was like, okay, take one, that's it. You know, with him, I realized that you might not have a second chance. <laughs> wow. A lot of those guys are just, you know, one-take guys. I mean, they figured if you're going to take a second take, you're going to copy yourself. And they had, you know, there's some, there's some logic to what they said, but that was really uh, a lot of pressure. My first recordings were with Elvin, and, you know, I, I, I would, after the first session, the record Genesis, I said, holy cow, man, how, how can I keep this, how do I know which take they're going to use? You don't know if you do do a second take. So uh, that was a, that was a quite a learning experience also with Elvin, of course. You're a prolific kind of cat. You're in the studio a lot, you know, along with glimpses. You have standards in Dublin. You're always recording. What is it about? you have a restless soul, or what? are you just trying to get it all out? Well, get it all out is one way of looking at it, especially as I get older. But I've always been pretty prolific in the studio. Um, I have a lot of styles that I like. 
and uh, you know projects. You know, if you, if you know my stuff, you know, ranging from the far right to the far left, I mean, strings, quartets, free music, and then on the other side, Sidney Bechet. I mean, I've always been interested in a lot of different ways of playing. And it's another lesson from Miles, again, which was that he, basically, his way of playing remained more or less the same, but he surrounded himself with different uh, different folks, and in his case, you know, great young musicians of each era, and he was, you know, he was prominent. And uh, it, he had no problem being really a true eclecticist. And I was always attracted to, like, a lot of styles. And I think my generation that grew up musically in the 60s was the first generation to be exposed easily, now without having to take a tape recorder to, you know, Kashmir or to uh, Ghana. You could get, itch, you know, you could find music in Folkways Records, Odeon Records, so that a typical listening day in the 60s when I would be with my my boys would be, you know, could go from Bar Talk to Coltrane to Albert Island to uh, Ravi Shankar. And I, I've always felt that that was a great way to represent myself within a variety of different projects and the common denominator being my, you know, the way I play. So whatever that is, that will always be there. So you got to see John Coltrane when you were growing up and you were younger in New York. What was that experience like at such a young, formative age? Well, I always talk about that first time I saw him in 62, uh, 15 years old. It was, I mean, the first thing was, that can't be the same instrument I have at home. <laughs> yeah, and of course it was a tennis saxophone. And... Uh, I said, how can you do that with that instrument that's under my my bed in my you know, my uh, home in Brooklyn that I practice in every day? So it was a it was a shock to the, to that part of it, you know to the fact that I played saxophone for a little bit by then. The other thing was just the incredible energy, what appeared to be honesty and sincerity above all, and particularly, especially for a young teenager, no pretense. There was no show. The show was the music. There was no, there was no show. There was no, uh, not even an announcement. Not even, you know, they, they tried, they had suits and ties on at that time. They got up, it was business. And their matter of fact, apparently a matter of fact attitude was very impressive to me. I said, how can they be doing all that and not do anything, you know, not make something out of it, you know, like, uh, Exaggerated or point something out on the how make it into a Hollywood event. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for words to describe what I'm saying, but I mean that there was a real sincerity and honesty and a business-like attitude that was very impressive to me at that age. So, of course, I saw him subsequently many times in New York until he passed. And uh, of course, then as I got a little more mature and became a better musician, trying to make an attempt to understand technically what he played. And that's still going on. Seeing somebody like Paul Train and seeing live performances is, is a huge learning point. But, you know, you got a, a history degree from New York University. You had a lot of great mentors. What what did you learn from those early mentors that have reverberated throughout your life, like advice they gave you and what they taught you? Well, particularly Elvin and Miles in different manifestations. But the bottom line was once you get on the bandstand and you put that instrument up to your mouth or your hands, whatever the instrument it is serious business, and it's 150% um, concentration, and uh, it's a, it, the bandstand is a kind of a, you know, it's a temple. It's where we go to pray, so to say, and uh, uh, pay respect to the masters who came before and to, you know, to ourselves and to the other four people or five people on the stage with you. Uh, and I got, when I, you know, not that I didn't think it was serious before, but I was in high school, I played with my peers, in college, I played with my peers, you know, once in a while I might have an opportunity to sit in with somebody of note, but, you know, when I got to Elvin Jones, and first Pete LaRocca, the drummer, he was my first mentor, and then Elvin, and then Miles, I mean, that was like undergraduate, graduate, master's degree, a doctoral degree, all those four years. It was the way these people concentrated when they played that was most impressive. And then, of course, from there, it's various aspects of what they played, which is more technical. So you've talked about Miles, you've talked about Elvin, there's a lot of legendary musicians that you've been around. When you became an NEA jazz master, did you have to pinch yourself after all of this time and getting to that point? What was it like? Well, Joe, you bring up a good point, which was, you know, when I walked into the room and, you know, they had a little kid um, on a lunch situation. We actually got the awards in the afternoon, you know, and uh, looked around and saw, you know, 
Ahmed Jamal and Roy Haynes, I, I forget, this is 2011. I said, I, you know, this is something, and I was the youngest to get it at that time. And, uh, I, I had to pitch myself to say, this is really, um, I felt very good about it. I mean, I had a lot accomplished a lot, of course, but to be in, you know, in the midst of uh, these gentlemen, who were, there were about 30 or 40 of them there that, that particular year, and uh, it was, you know, it was quite an honor and privilege to be led into that circle. What has it been like for you? What has been the key to you and your longevity? You've gone through so many phases of music. You obviously love music to your core. What has it been about your longevity that's kept you going so prolifically now into this day and era in 2018? Well, that's a fair question. I mean, it is the beauty and magic of this music we play. This is some beautiful stuff, and it's improvised, and it's it's ecumenical. It has no color, no creed, no religion. It's just music. Um, it, there's a degree of just a degree of honesty, and you know, in the music itself. And I'm not talking about the personalities because that couldn't like any anything in the world. You talk about people who go from one extreme to another. But the music is above personality. The music is above, like, feeling love, even or hate or interest. The music is beyond words. I mean, it's, it's human beings that put meaning into the music. But the music, when you look at it, it's notes that go into the air, and there's no replication of them. Even the best we can do is write something down on paper, but that's, a, you know, a shallow a pre- a representation of the music. So it, the music is... It belongs to another area of the world, of life, of spirit, or whatever you like to put it. And uh, being able to have a life in that, with that being the center of your activities, is, again, a privilege. And I am so fortunate to have been able to, you know, go on and still continue to do what I have to do. But I just, you know, the feeling you get, I, I call it, the, if the French have a perfect way of saying it. This is on my website, on the, on the main page, Le Roi du Monde, which is the king of the world. When you're playing and everything's right, in that moment, you are the king of the world. Amen. So you've seen jazz change so much over time, from the elder statesman of jazz that you got to play with early on and learn from, all the way to today being an elder statesman that's teaching the new generation. How is jazz doing in 2018 as an organism, as a art form? Well, it's funny. I just got found an interview on YouTube where I talk about the state of the business that somebody did with me radio. I don't, I don't even know who it was, but uh, and I'm, I'm, as you were calling, I'm putting it on my site. It is a two-headed beast, but music is in the best shape, in my opinion, that it's ever been. And that's because of the influx of so many young people, of course, but being schooled and educated. That's the big difference between this generation and last, you know, 50 years ago when I was doing it. Uh, these young people have a chance to YouTube, to being taught by people like me and really good teachers. Uh, they have a chance to really learn the music well, and they are. They are so advanced and so much talent around. And, of course, when you're young, you try everything, like like I did in my 20s. You know, you put a tablo with a bass drum with a, you know, with a flugel horn or whatever, you know, or you, you put a beat from China with a chord from Europe or something. I mean, the mixtures are... Really, um, there's no limit to what can happen when we bring in world influences, which is what's happening. I mean, I see more and more students from, uh, uh, guys from uh, South Africa, of course, Europe, of course, Israel. I mean, my class, I teach it at high school music, and half the kids are from another place. This is the very, the most positive aspect of the music I've seen in, in its years. On the other hand, the business is completely almost gone as far as what the business was in my time of a record deal, of promotion, of getting paid, of publishing, of not having a book put on the internet the day after it's published, et cetera, et cetera. That is, you know, this is a problem for theater and uh, literature and certainly poetry. I mean, the internet has level, made the, le- the playing ground level, which in a, in a certain respect is great because that means somebody sitting in the Thailand jungle can, you know, hear John Coltrane. On the other hand, the business model is completely you know, destroyed. So when I see the young ones, I say, you know, please make sure you got something in your back pocket because making a living here in this day and age is extremely difficult. This, the business itself plus the competition because there are so many students now being graduated. Every June you add another thousand saxophone players to the pool, of which probably 80 and 90 percent can really play pretty well. So the state of jazz is a two-headed beast at the moment. 
So at this point in your life, are you happy with your career? Yes. I feel like I've done what I wanted to do. I certainly would be like have a little more financial security, obviously. And, you know, we have to know I can work as much as I, I've been able to, you know, physically and mentally and so forth. But uh, when I look back, I really, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I don't know who that guy is who did that. <laughs> when I look at all the books and all the damn records and shit, I, I just, even the composition, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't know that guy. I, mean, I know him, but I don't remember him or something. Um, so I, you know, I feel good about my uh, output. I have also given my archives to Berkeley School of Music, We're having an official opening in November. Um, you know, my, my recordings and notes and lead sheets and books and blah, blah, blah. So, I've, uh, oh, you know, hopefully there'll be somebody in a hundred years who <laughs> will whoever this guy was from Brooklyn, New York, wherever that is, you know. Absolutely. So, yeah. what's left for you to accomplish? I mean, you, you keep releasing material. You're obviously, as we established up front, you kind of have this restless soul nature about you. What do you, what, what do you want to get done? What, what are some of the things that, haven't happened in your career that you're like, man, this needs to happen. I can't say anything, Joe. I'll tell you the truth. I really have seen the mountain <laughs> to call somebody, you know. I mean, I've been on the mountaintop uh, as a side man, as a leader. Uh, recognition. I mean, you know, I, I have an NEA award, the biggest award from the American government, you know, etc. I mean, I, I would love to play with maybe, I don't may sit me right now, but you know, play with this guy or that guy or make a record with so-and-so, have a collaboration. You know, you're always looking at who you would like to um, get musically involved with. And, of course, that, you know, again, uh, offhand, I, a lot of people, you know, and also world music and all that. But I feel pretty good about what I've done. And uh, my list of projects is still at about 20 projects. So <laughs> I got more to, I got more to do, you know, that's for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So you've been around the elder statesmen, around the legends. You're a legend now. And I want to know this. How important is it for folks in the country, whether it's radio or listeners, to keep this jazz torch burning brightly and moving on, keeping the stories and keeping everything from, say, Coltrane and all these older cats, the, the current. How important is it for us to keep that torch burning brightly as we move on? It's just, uh, it is like other art. Forms of art important to keep culture in front of the of people because we you know we're increasingly in an age of uh, you know of automation I mean, that's a that's a light word for what's going on and the human element I'm sure we could all, you know we could talk about this for hours the human element being replaced by robots you know food seem to be replaced maybe by taking one pill a day instead of eating I mean etc uh, you know the next fifty years is I mean, apparently, it seems to me it's going to be crucial to, you know, what mankind will end up being. And culture is, is you know, important, necessary, and should be a part of people's lives. And they need it, and they want it. But, of course, they need that time, and they need to be able to do it. We have so many distractions now. We have so much mechanization happening that... Um, the human element sometimes, and I'm, I'm afraid. And, we, you know, people in my uh, experience and stage of life, we're looking back and looking forward and saying, God, I hope this continues, you know. Now, on the other hand, it is being com collected, notated, interviews. I mean, the research now in the last 10 to 15 years because of the Internet is, you know, you can really sit and study jazz from A to Z for the rest of your life. So there's ample opportunity. That's a good part. Uh, will there be ample interest? And with a business that's basically given up on the model, I have trepidation about the future in that respect. And those people who do understand the music and love it, as you do, as I do, have a responsibility. And uh, there's no fear of the people not doing their job. We all know that we have to educate. We all know that we have to talk to Dave Liebman while he's still alive. Uh, we all, you know, we know that. And that's the good part. It's just keeping it, you know, like what you're doing and what I do, it's all part of the, the, the construction of the house, you know, the foundation and then the walls and then the roof. And we have to keep it going. And that's uh, pretty clear. And people who like jazz, they by and large are pretty hip people. You know, they are. You know, it, it's a, it, the music is so, has such humanity in it that why would one be attracted to it unless they were really interested in the feeling about it? There's no monetary rewards. Uh, it's not going to be played on the jukebox or in your, in your car necessarily. But you do it because you love the music, and that's 99% of the people in this music are really in it because they love it, and they will not give up the ship easily.
<laughs> That's for sure. That, yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely. So let me ask you this. Everyone has a perception of who you are, your family, your friends, your fans, colleagues, but you know yourself best. Who do you think you are? Well, I'm a triple-A personality, whatever that is. Um, couldn't get enough A's on it. Um, with a lot of energy. I have been able to keep that up uh, pretty well over the years. I like to finish what I start. That's why the projects get finished. Um, I, if I start something and I plead with my students, please, if you begin something, you must finish it for whatever it's worth, put it on the shelf, and move on to the next thing. And I've always felt that being sincere and honest about the music will lead to that kind of behavior in your real life. And uh, it will influence, in the case of somebody who teaches and has a chance to see young people, it will influence somebody some, sometime along the way. I mean, when I see 30, 50 students like I did last week in, in Massachusetts and so forth, I say, you know, one or two of these people will really get the point. And the other 48 will have had you know, interesting afternoon, but there's always one or two whose life you may be able to change and turn around. Well, not turn around, but um, put the put the light in front of them so they have something concrete, you know. And then one 16-year-old last week, I could see he had that look in his face. After the class, I talked to him. I said, you know, how long you can play, what do you play, who are you interested in, et cetera. And he was a kid. He said, man, this is, I had such a good time. Thank you so much for what you for the last hour or two. I said, okay, Ian, you're on your way. And I'll be seeing you down the road because we will meet again. I promise you. Beautiful. That's a great way to wrap everything up. Dave, thank you for opening up. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you, bro. And you continue the good work, too. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview. We give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Dave for his class, his music, and his legendary time. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. For everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.